June 19, 1975. A day like any other in the slow procession of eons for the great white shark. Millions of years had left an exquisite design practically unchanged. Sleek, gray, powerful. A force that was virtually unchallenged in the sea. One definition of beauty. The next day, in our minds at least, everything would change. That's when a film called Jaws would open in theaters across the United States. Where there was once a fish, there was now a monster. I remember thinking this as I was writing it. The, the shark was like a maniac to me. It was an unstoppable, uncontrollable force. And that, when I was a child, was always the most scary thing, was the maniac, the, the guy with the ax who you couldn't stop. Did you hear your father? I'm the one now. The shark, swallow you whole. You're going to need a bigger boat. Without realizing it, I tapped a nerve in people the very primal fear of being eaten in the ocean. In an environment in which we choose to go, there is an actual, genuine danger that something could eat you. And what a horrible way to go. Oh, nice. Wow. Now, 25 years later, National Geographic magazine has dispatched an expedition to create a new non-fiction portrait of the Great White. Give us a signal when you want to come up. Jaws author Peter Benchley has been enlisted to write the story, a yarn that this time will be driven by fascination and not fear. To help paint the portrait, Benchley will be joined by world-renowned underwater photographer David Dubelet. Where is he? Where is he? Where is he? And legendary Australian guide and shark attack survivor Rodney Fox. I don't have to show my scars anymore. I'll show the seal. Over the course of three months spent in Australian and South African waters, they will pull back the ocean's blue veil to reveal amazing new discoveries about the fish we love to hate. Has 25 years of research and learning transformed the monster back into a fish? fear incarnate, cutting through the midnight blue waters of South Australia, a predator on her deadly rounds, oblivious to her leading role in this drama. This is a story about fear, a story about Benchley, the man who unleashed it. Lift it higher! About Rodney Fox, a man who almost died in the mouth of a great white and was forever changed by it. And it is a story about David Dubelet. See there? The man who must photograph the inspiration behind all this fear. Come on, come on, come on. Oh, hello, darling. The success and the absolute wonderful thing about this myth is it has, it's based on total reality. It's a real monster, real monster. 
And Every they, other monster plays catch up. And they do so many yeah. crazy and stupid things at times yeah. that just relate to your movie. You can't say it doesn't happen because they've done it. As David, you said it's reality. This is an animal. It may not want to hurt you, but damn it, it will eat you. But to tell the story well, they must temper that fear with knowledge. They must show us the brilliance of this perfect fish before it's too late. David Dubelay badly needs to meet this fish and to get closer than he ever has before. For this, he relies on Rodney Fox, who has spent more than 30 years bringing photographers and sharks together. It's a dicey business because great whites make for temperamental subjects. Here he comes, here he comes. They're skittish. Ah, you tricky little beggar. Sometimes shy. All right, where is he? And they can also kill you. I could have put him right in if you wanted. Yeah, I should have. Let's do it. Just getting a better frame on him. I wasn't scared. The laughter betrays a real fear. And it's not just a fear of being eaten. With a perfectionist like David, it's a fear of failing. You know exactly what you want, but it's never there. Over the years, I shot 500 rolls. 500 rolls of great white shark pictures. Somewhere stashed and then the, the great Dublin archives in New York. There's five pictures. There's five good pictures that I like. Their sharkness, their absolute sharkness is very elusive. Absolute sharkness is a many splendored thing. For David, it will be a series of pictures that define a great white. It's beautiful. To get some of these shots, David will use an invention called the pole camera. Cool. Okay, here we go. With this system, David becomes a virtual diver. Through his video goggles, he can see what the camera sees. He's effectively underwater without getting wet. The pole cam is the ultimate, I'm not there, but the camera is perspective. So I can do anything I want with the camera, including shove it in the shark's mouth. I'm seeing blue water. I am seeing no white death. Now, if the shark would just come back, he might have a chance to get that shot. This disappearing shark is David's first hint of the trouble ahead. You could spend, uh, you could spend a lifetime looking for it. While Dubelay awaits virtual intimacy with the sharks at sea, Benchley will be getting a closer look at the fish on land. It's a piece of meat. Yes, it's a shame. He has come to the South Australian Aquatic Sciences Center, where this huge, dead female great white is on public display. Months earlier, the shark inadvertently got tangled in a snapper fisherman's long line and drowned. Word of the accidental catch spread fast, and a massive crowd was waiting at the town dock when the shark was towed in. She was given to scientists for dissection, and a search began for a place to keep her in the meantime. After nine months in a huge freezer, the shark has emerged for its final public appearance. An astounding 12,000 people have shown up to see and touch this icon of fear. This public fascination with the shark may give Benchley a new angle for a story that badly needs one. No, it won't bite you. This has been done to death. White sharks have been photographed time and time and time again. Everybody's written about them. Each of us has got a terrible challenge to come up with a new way of portraying this animal. Benchley's new way will explore our obsession with beasts that can kill us. Both he and Australian marine biologist Dr. Barry Bruce know it's a sentiment rooted deep inside us. I think we're fascinated by, by things like this, by, by, by sharks of this size, by the by, by point of them, the whole mythology of them. This goes back to monsters. This is that E.O. Yeah. I mean, Wilson quote. So, in, a truly, in a tribal sense, yeah. we love our monsters. It's so, true. Right. This is one of the last dragons in the world. Our love of monsters helps explain the success of Jaws. Benchley is often criticized for having created Jaws. 
but he didn't create our fear. Like any good writer, he just exploited it. This is a great white, Larry, a big one. And any shark expert in the world will tell you it's a killer, it's a man-eater. What we are dealing with here is a perfect engine, uh, an eating machine. It's really a miracle of evolution. All this machine does is swim and eat and make little sharks, and that's all. Now, why don't you take a long, close look at this sign? Those proportions are correct. Love to prove that, wouldn't you? Get your name into the National Geographic. <laughs> but Hooper never did publish. Benchley, on the other hand, will. And in doing so, hopes to reveal that the monster is even more fascinating than the myth created by the movie. To do that, he's going to look inside of this. Almost 18 feet long and weighing close to 3,000 pounds, the once mythic fish has defrosted, deflated, and is about to be dissected. I've seen these guys in the wild, and I've seen them swimming around. Uh, and, and there's a certain degree of majesty about them, and it's a kind of a shame to see them like this. But this is one of the ways that we get to understand how they work. This is a good Their extraordinary encounter begins as Dr. Bruce reads the shark, looking for any hints about her life that may be apparent on her skin. The most interesting clue is a scar from the bite of another great white. Curiously, this may be evidence that the shark has recently mated. White sharks, kind of, when they get friendly, when they, when they go to mate, they don't have hands to grab onto each other with, but they have to come together and hold together. And the way they do that is they bite each other. Um, now, the females developed a very thick skin, much thicker than the male, to be able to accommodate this. So these sort of we have only a general female. idea of how great whites mate, based on observations of other species. For example, nurse sharks have recently been photographed while mating in the wild. A male bites a female on the pectoral fins, attempting to spin her over. He then tries to copulate by pushing one of his two claspers into her cloaca, where the sperm is transferred. The process may be similar with great whites, though perhaps occurring in deeper water. This might be just a love bite, a pre-love bite. Yes. This is foreplay. <laughs> um, you often the love bite could mean this female is carrying young. If she is, it would be a boon for science, a rare occasion to answer some basic questions about shark reproduction. But they won't know if she's pregnant for sure until they open her up. It's just over 5.1 meters. Just lower her down halfway. Back at sea, a shark has returned to the boat, prompting Dubelet and his team to board the shark cages. Well, this will be a test run, but it's the real thing, because there's a shark out there. These low-tech, armored elevators deliver them to the shark's door. Here's the shark now. Hurry up, you guys. You ready? Go ahead. Go behind you. Everybody ready? Yeah. Ready. Okay, lower down. It is down here with a camera in his hands and a shark nearby that David takes his biggest risks because a camera can make a photographer feel invisible. War photographers say that. They'll do the most astounding stupid things because they have a camera in front of their face. And underwater, it's the same thing. You, you put all your concentration into making everything fit into a tiny frame. If you take your camera away from your eye in the cage, all of a sudden the creature becomes much larger uh, and much more dangerous looking. And, uh, and all of a sudden you say, my God, this is really scary. Though the cage is their greatest asset, considering the toothy subject, the bars get in the way of some great shots. To get around that problem, they play a kind of game that you might call shark tag. Sliding the door of the cage open as the shark approaches, and slamming it when it comes too close. 
In calm seas, it wouldn't be a problem, but with surging waters, the cages often tip and a weighted diver can easily fall out, making the I got you part of the game a potentially bloody affair. I'm not really afraid of this. I'm afraid of failing. I'm afraid of white sharks not showing up. I'm afraid of underexposure or overexposure. Something out of focus. Or not getting the picture I really want to get. But because David usually does get the shot, he continues to set the standard for underwater photography. Yet rarely in the annals of adventure photography do you find a more unlikely character than David Dubelay. He is not a lover of gravity, nor of the things that bind him to the earth. The sea for me growing up in New Jersey was the most enormous escape. When you put your head below, everything else disappears, everything. You're weightless, I could breathe that asthma when I was a child, so being underwater and swimming was the place I could be weightless. You know, on, on land I was, you know, I was a flub -a -flub -a dubbing around, wheezing and, and uh, clanking, but on, on underwater I was a god, I could fly. Dubelay discovered the sea as a little boy and began snorkeling when he was eight years old. By the age of 16, he'd published his first underwater photo, 38 years later, he can claim more than 50 articles for National Geographic. Through that brilliant portfolio, Dubelay has brought the splendor of the seas to millions of people around the world. He's done it in spite of some surprising limitations. Do you get seasick? My entire life I've been seasick. I spent all my life at sea, I get seasick still. He's battling more than upset stomach on this job. It's hard being the life of a photographer. That's because he's trying to photograph something that is not only rare, it is utterly uncontrollable. Though perhaps not entirely unpredictable. While underwater, they notice that the sharks often seem to bite the boats and cages. This behavior can be linked to a curious part of the shark's anatomy an electrosensitive organ that Benchley and Dr. Bruce are examining. There are a lot of reports of white sharks biting outboard motors, and that's because they too give off electrical fields. Right. And that can confuse a, a white shark into coming along and going, wow, that's, that, that, that feels like something that's alive. We'll, we'll have a bit of a bite of that. Right, I, I remember the first time I saw one of these bite the dive step on the back of yeah. the boat, and it looked very aggressive, but it yeah. was in fact just trying to figure out what it was. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they do get confused. The shark yeah, detects so these electrical fields through a series of tiny holes around its snout, known as the ampullae of Lorenzini. This is an amazing the sensory sophistication. Of yeah. this, uh, See, this, nobody had any idea of this years ago. No, no. Well, yeah, that's right. Uh, this sensory ability is matched by remarkable physical adaptations, starting with skin so thick and tough it would make any politician jealous. Okay. Lordy, that is okay, thick skin. Just a bit. The fact that it is so discreet, the skin itself is, is a completely separate organ from the from the oh, liver, yes. from whatever. It's but it's it's they're not attached anyway. One, I have this vision of thousands of veins and nerves and things. The myth of being able to lie underneath a shark and plunge your dagger up through its belly. <laughs> Is it just that, a myth? This is liver here, right? This entire thing? We'll see, we'll see in just a moment. The shark's massive liver is divided into two lobes that run the length of its body cavity. The liver is a huge storehouse for energy, possibly enabling the shark to go long periods without feeding. And the, liver, the liver weight is anywhere between 20 and 30 percent of body weight. So they're huge livers, right. very big livers. The stomach is wanting to come yeah. out and fall down now. The okay. beauty of the dissection that the is that you can blithely go where no one would ever hope to be, the stomach of a great white. It isn't the most fragrant part of the job, but it is often the most revealing. Now, my guess would be that this was called on a snap-along line. <laughs> 
Look at yeah. that. Hook, line, everything. This shark has been, has come up to a long line. There's been snapper on it. And it's worked its way along the long line, picking up snapper on, along the way. And at some stage, it's picked up the long line itself, got wrapped up, and that was its demise. When the previous prey items are digested, you know, they just leave little clues in the stomach as to what they were. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to identify them. Bones, right? so beaks, bones that... beaks, eyeballs, otoliths, mm -hmm. ear bones, all those things can help you identify what's, what it's been eating. What it's yeah. been eating. I suppose rings, bracelets, necklaces also <laughs> would give you an indication of the class of person that's been eating. Feeling yeah, that's yeah. Yes. The list of stomach contents reads like the stock list for an underwater Walmart. Eight fish hooks, several yards of fishing line, the remains of three large snappers, and three stingrays. This is a stingray barb? It is. And, and it was just like that? They find that at least one stingray didn't go down the shark's throat without a fight. It's probably a bit, wow, it's really stuck in there. Now, she swallowed this, presumably, and would this eventually, yeah. whoa, would the, would the flesh insist this and then reject it, or would this stay there? Well, I, I suspect this, this may well have worked its right, way right through and come out the other side. That's a distinct possibility, the way it was looking. Any animal that can effectively process something like a four-inch dagger is the definition of resilience and proof of how well adapted these sharks are. While they very well may be resilient, David is finding that they lack good cooperation skills. The current shark comes close, but won't take any bait. It's part of an eternal struggle for sharking expert Rodney Fox. So we'll put some more chum in. You can lead a shark to a chum slick, but you can't make him eat. You gotta fire the shark, Rodney. Fire it? Why? It's like a high it. school sweetheart. High school sweetheart. And promises, promises, and then uh, she never does anything. And then she hey, this away. is really good action. This is what yeah. you were here to expect. Yeah. So annoying, the shark. I thought you'd be very happy. David thinks the shark has been fed too much bait. Rodney disagrees. It's typical of their long and happily querulous friendship. Uh, you know, the first one that came in this morning you know, could never have eaten 80 pounds of salmon. Yeah. But the stomach would show, right? Like, a bit like yours. Mm, thank you, darling. <laughs> Behind the cajoling is a serious concern. David has only worked with two sharks so far and doesn't think he has any photos that show absolute sharkness. The lack of sharks is aggravating enough, but then Mother Nature plays another cruel card and the wind begins to howl. For three days, they're blown out of the water and onto the decks. We're just waiting, waiting. It may look clear and sunny, but it's too rough to take pictures. Wax on, wax off. Zen and the underwater photographer. I'm feeling desperate. Deprived, indifferent, well, disgusted, desperate. I got this theory, you see. Yeah. There's always a low period in your life. There's a high period. You mean to tell me that you have to take it? The good with the bad? Hey, you the bad. Two more precious days pass, and there is still no change in the weather. Most irritating of all is that there's a shark hanging around the boat, tempting them to get in. It's rough as hell. If we put the cage in, we get smashed like a, you know, a dice in a dice cup. And uh, if we try and shoot with a pole camera, you're going up and down four or five feet. The shark's not, but you are. But I'm looking, at the, I'm looking at the light going into the water. It's just perfect. You know, in a situation like this, the only thing that's available is to kill yourself because of the frustration. In Rodney, David has a sympathetic ear. He's worked enough with David to know that what David wants takes time and luck. I think David wants to put the people into the picture and give, let them have that emotional feeling of seeing the shark with its teeth showing. It's like looking down the barrel of a pistol. You know, you're really uh, looking at something that you're frightened of. 
Rodney would know. Few people on the planet have the same visceral feel for great whites that Rodney has, and few would want it. In December of 1963, Fox was 23 years old and competing to regain his crown in the annual South Australia Spearfishing Championship. At the time, he was, ironically, a life insurance salesman. During the middle of the competition, just as he was zeroing in on a target, Fox himself became the prey. I was about to spear the fish when all of a sudden this huge thump and crash hit me in the side and knocked the gun out of my hand, the mask off my face, and I was held through the water at great speed. Close to drowning and still caught in its mouth, Rodney instinctively gouged at its eyes until the shark let go. He somehow made it to the surface where, miraculously, a nearby boat plucked him from the sea. Less than an hour later, Rodney arrived at Royal Adelaide Hospital, clinging to life. His left lung was punctured, his collarbone and every rib on his left side broken. His abdomen had been ripped open. If not for his neoprene wetsuit, Rodney would have literally fallen apart. You hope to continue skin diving one day? No, I'll get in the water somewhere sometime, but I don't know whether I'll uh, go in this, this gulf here where there's been two or three attacks in the last few years. Before he could get back in the water, Rodney had to be sewn together with over 450 stitches. He spent a painful two months bedridden in the hospital. And worst of all, was the enduring, searing memory of the attack. Less than a year later, Rodney got back in the sea, this time with a mission to protect people from sharks. At the time, he thought the best way to do that was to simply kill them. And at that time, I didn't care about killing sharks, and I shot quite a few. Boom, it would just blow their heads off. But I started to realize after a while, they were very hard to find. There weren't many sharks, and this didn't seem to be the answer. Rodney gradually experienced a kind of conversion. Over the better part of the last 37 years, he has become one of the shark's greatest champions. Amazingly, the man who almost died in the mouth of a great white was instrumental in passing legislation that protected them in South Australia. Perhaps it's surprising, then, that Rodney must still reckon with his fear. When you look at the statistics, which I've had to do to mentally prepare myself to go back in the water, I found out that the chance of shark attack is so remote that it's not worth considering. But try telling my heart, my brain that, when you see these incredible sharks underwater, you just emotionally go to pieces. The natural air of menace typical of the great white has been drained out of the dead shark. With her gut lain open to the world, Dr. Bruce is close to answering the most critical question of the dissection. Is she carrying young? There's no obvious sign of, of young in this one at the moment. Um, now these are the uteri, the uteri. This is where the young would be when it's pregnant. You can see these are just big flaccid hollow sacs at the moment. They, don't they may not have found pups, but they have found tiny great white shark sure. eggs. We, we think, there we go. Are those eggs really? We believe so, yes. Those little yes. white yes. things are eggs. Wow. But it turns out that the eggs have suffered freezer damage and can't be studied. This is extremely disappointing for scientists because what they do know about how sharks reproduce doesn't bode well for the species. If we look at the biology of these things, they don't reproduce until they're quite large. They don't reproduce until they're relatively old. And when they do reproduce, they don't reproduce very many young. And those young usually have a good chance of survival. So the, the, the reproductive rate will about roughly match the mortality rate. They're not designed to be killed by non-natural means.
The shark has yielded many secrets to the knife, but perhaps the most compelling was the one revealed by her death. The monster of our imagination is secretly fragile. Scientists believe that many great whites are killed by accident each year, but at least this one did not die in vain. Through Benchley, that secret fragility and the revelations about the shark's internal perfection will reach millions. Now it's up to David to capture compelling images of the shark's external perfection. But even at the end of what seemed to have been a fruitful day, Dubelay knows he's still at the mercy of a diabolical creature. They know exactly when you are out of film. They know when you're not looking in their direction. They know when you have the wrong exposure. And when they do that, and when you know all of those things, then they do absolutely spectacular things when your back is turned. That's their job. This is the most frustrating of all animals. I suppose maybe it's worse with a giant panda, but at least you're dry. That's cold! While David and Rodney have been disappointed with the number of sharks they've seen, people like Damon and Dion Edmonds are happy if the sharks never show up. The Edmonds brothers are abalone divers. They spend roughly 80 days a year pulling their livelihood out of the same waters that the Great White calls home. Theirs is one of the only jobs in the world that can list great white shark attack as an occupational hazard. Benchley has come to find out why anyone would take that kind of risk. Part of the answer is money. These all seem to be good size, don't Abalone they? fishing is tightly controlled in Australia, and the Edmonds license earns the brothers over $350,000 per year. But it comes with a price. On a murky gray day, they were working near a coastal island, home to a small colony of sea lions. With Dion manning the wheel, Damon went in and set to work. He'd been in for about an hour when he felt a strange presence and quickly turned to find a great white just over his shoulder. He instantly dropped into the weeds, clutching his dive bag to his chest for protection. But a weed got wrapped around his mask and ripped it off his face. I had my hand on my nose so I could still breathe properly without taking water in through my nose. Then trying to search for my mask and get that back on, and then I'm you know, trying to find the shark again. Because it was going straight above me about an arm's distance. Could have touched it. Did you have any idea what was going on? Do you know? Well, not at first. Uh, he sent the he sent the bag up after about uh, on the parachute. He floated the parachute. It came up to the surface. I picked it up like I normally do, and the bag wasn't quite full. It wasn't wasn't full of abs. And I thought, oh, well, maybe he's gone to swim off. Dion sent the bag down again, but it came right back up, empty. Thinking the bag wasn't making it all the way to the bottom, Dion weighted it with a rock and threw it back in. Ten minutes later, he retrieved the empty bag for the last time. And I picked it up, and it had this big hole torn in it. Oh, oh God! <laughs> yeah. I think I just went into autopilot after a while and just tried not to think about it, and just was the, mainly thinking that, yes, he's gonna, I'm gonna see him, he will come up. But Damon had seen the shark rip into the bag near the surface, and knew if he left the safety of the bottom, he'd be ripped apart too. The only hope was to wait out the shark, though he'd already been in the cold water for two hours. Suddenly, the shark became more aggressive. It began to menace him, swimming past even closer than before. In a horrible twist, Damon's air hose, his lifeline to the surface, had suddenly become his biggest liability. One bite on the hose, and Damon would have to break for the surface. My air hose was hitting the nose of the shark, and it sort of slid off onto its side fin, the pectoral fin. 
support on that, so I had to hold on to my regulator hose. As you're being dragged away? To make sure I didn't pull out of my mouth, yeah. But then uh. it slipped off, luckily, and it, that happened three or four times. <laughs> yeah. By now, Damon had been underwater for a bone-chilling four hours. Fearing that hypothermia would make him delirious, he decided that on the shark's next pass, he would follow it into shallower water. Just as he made his move, another shadow appeared. It was the mobile cage of an abalone diver come to rescue him. So I just sort of went hooray to this guy in the cage and um, quickly tried to dive in there with him head first. Damon and Dion now use a mobile cage whenever working in suspect waters. Because we know that great whites generally feed at the surface, Damon's instinct to hug the bottom may have saved his life. Come on, John. After weeks of working apart, Benchley has joined David and Rodney. Peter's objective is to get down in the cage and see the beast firsthand. Good luck. And also, keep your elbows in when you come. Oh, uh, yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, but the shark seems to have other ideas. I think they're a little shy. Every time they lower the cage into the water, the shark seems to bolt. This happens several times. So the shark didn't come back? No. Could it be that the shark is afraid of Benchley? Every time we come out of the water, the sharks come back. And out. Um, and gone. Keep going, keep going. For Dubele, the situation is dire. You know, I hate the bastard. With only two days left on the Australian shoot, the images of absolute sharkness have proved elusive. No matter what he tries. Okay. Who's gonna call the shark? All right, ready? Okay, you guys go. Ready? I don't know why he is so picky that he won't come in here and buy David's camera. It's a perfectly nice camera. Nice salmon on it. That's got a nice salmon on it. There's no reason he shouldn't come and bite this nice yeah, camera. That's that good looking as that. That's that delicious or what? Camera. Yeah, I feel like a pizza guy. Look at that. It's a fish cam. Shark's anti-Semitic, hates Jewish underwater photographers. <laughs> I know. I don't think they just picking on you, Dave. They're, they're picking not, on me. No, they're not picking Everybody on else you. gets pictures. Television guys get pictures, but <laughs> me, no. The minute I put the camera and the shark takes off, and then he comes back, I have lunch, and he goes away. Around midday, Dubele plays a hunch. While everyone agrees to break for lunch, he lingers. Sure enough, when the deck clears, the shark comes in with startling results. So what do you mean doing? Well, we've been having lunch. The shark has been uh, feeding on uh, plexiglass. The shark came right in and made three distinct passes on the, on the camera. And it just mouthed it and tried to hold on to it as tight as it could. So it was biting the dome. And its uh, top tooth went right through the dome. I think, uh, fortunately, on the last pass, because there wasn't that much uh, water in the camera. You know, those Doritos tasted pretty good, but I wish I would have been here to see this. But one, other, one thing I really, really want to know, David, did you get the shot? <laughs> One sure thing is that a shark is back and biting. Rodney and Peter head into the cage. For Benchley, seeing the real shark always brings back memories of that other one. One of these days, one of these fellows is going to take revenge for Jaws, but I don't want to be around when he does. The shark, especially when we're in the water with him, this big white shark, the ultimate, the apex predator, the animal in the sea, 
This, if ever there were something to humble a human being, it's, it's this animal. My worry, my main fear, is that someday my children's children may not be able to see this magnificent animal in the wild, that they'll know them only from photographs or videotape. We can't let that happen. We just can't. As long as I live, there will never be a more beautiful sight in the world than one of those big, more beautiful monsters cruising by. Just like a torpedo made out of stainless steel. <laughs> Peter's heyday is cold comfort for David. Of the 28 days they've spent at sea, he's been able to work with sharks on only six of them. Last chance, last call. If David seems subdued, it's because he doesn't have the pictures he needs. Thanks for all the fish. And this leg of the expedition is over. Don't worry, David. You'll get them in South Africa. I'm hoping. Three months later, the expedition resumes off the coast of South Africa, near the Cape of Good Hope. Here in False Bay, two oceans meet in a welling of rich waters that attract all manner of sea life to eat and be eaten. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Huge pods of common and dusky dolphins move across a bay teeming with yellowtail and tuna. The great white is here in large numbers too, drawn by thousands of Cape fur seals that pack a tiny rookery named Seal Island. That's kind of cool. The team has also been lured here, not only by the promise of plentiful sharks, but by tales of their remarkable behavior Something incredible is happening in the waters off of Seal Island. Here, great white sharks routinely pursue seals with such unbridled power that they breach the surface of the bay and literally fly out of the sea. If Dubelay can capture a breach, it would be a stunning coup a photo of a predation behavior that would utterly redefine the idea of absolute sharkness. To get the shot, he has teamed with local naturalists Chris Fallows and Rob Lawrence. Chris and Rob have learned that it's possible to provoke a breach by towing a seal-shaped decoy behind the boat. Over the course of a year of towing, they've managed to capture a few breaches on film. David will try to do the same in just 10 days. Oh, that's dramatic. God, I'd, like, I'd love to see that. It's a wonderful picture, wonderful picture. OK, in we go. As the decoy goes in, David faces another challenge. It's virtually impossible to predict when or if a shark will breach. Come on, come on baby, come on. Light my fire. That's it, that's it. Tedious minutes pass. If Dubelay wants the shot, he must keep his eye locked on the camera viewfinder. Where is it? Where is it? If he wavers, he risks missing the breach. Damn! Anyone get it? God almighty. Did you get the shot though, David? No. No. Saw it, got it, didn't get it. Well, did you see it? It came up complete <laughs> circle. And that was, a, in my judgment, a big animal, but that maybe be... There, oh, there, there it is. is again, right here. Wow. <laughs> Missed it. <laughs> my eye waited just for a second. I think I got some of it. Take it again, mama! <laughs> This is a moment. This is the Muhammad Ali punch. This is something that happens so quickly, so fast. I well, miss that. It's a reaction time. It's a blink of an eye. This thing in the beautiful morning light to and have this to, fabulous animal up in a kind of balletic contortion. It was just wonderful. It oh my God, it bit the head. It's like a praying mantis. 
When they reel in what's left of the decoy, they find that the shark has left a calling card. Hey, look at hey, it. Hey, Teddy. Winner! Hey, hey. First start ever. Right, just give me a look. How long are you ready for that? That was hot. Hey, look at that. Oh, honey, you don't look so good. In spite of all the amazing action, Dubelay is still holding an empty bag. I just, just keep looking and looking, and, and it's sort of a grinding of teeth situation rather than saying anything to myself. My mind is a, a blank with, uh, with flashes of red, red hot anger because nothing's going right. Perhaps the most stunned observer is Rodney Fox, who in 37 years of sharking thought he'd seen it all. I just never seen anything jump out of the water just like that. That's just uh, to see a thousand pound animal come flying out of the water chasing its food really makes you feel that very excited but also a little humbling and you know I, I, the power of it all is just inspiring to me and it's a bit nerve wracking too. This nerve-wracking experience comes to an end around nine each morning. As the sun rises higher, the sharks don't seem to breach as much, so the team stops towing. David has to wait until evening for another chance. Until then, he's intent on photographing any evidence of predation he can find among the seals. He doesn't have to look long. Clinging to the rocky shore is a young adult bearing the unmistakable scars of a great white attack. The wounded seal eventually washes into the sea where it flounders. Where is he? Did he die? Once it drifts away from the relative safety of the shallows, it's just a matter of time. This is one place in the ocean where you don't want to fall out of your boat. But for Rocky Strong, a marine biologist studying great white shark predation, there's nowhere he'd rather be. This is a special place, and it's probably the only little rock in the world where this happens the way it does. Rocky, supported by a grant from the National Geographic Society, will be working side by side with the team. Through experiments and observation, he's developing a provocative theory to explain breaching. An animal that we thought was driven only by instinct may actually have the ability to learn. There's something about this place and about the conditions here that calls white sharks coming in and out to breach. Um, it's, it's not that one tells the other one, I'm, you know, I'm breaching and it's working. You know, they have to figure it out. It's a combination of things. One thing they may have figured out is how to exploit a murky layer of water near the island. It is definitely true that on several days we had a gunky layer down there about 15 feet. So you've got a relatively clear layer of water sitting on a murky layer of water. The sharks may very well be, and it's a little premature, but they may be swimming through this, this gunky water, just peeking up into the clear water to see seals passing overhead. And so begins a deadly dance between shark and seal. It usually happens at dawn or dusk, often as the seals depart or return to the island from feeding. About 400 meters from the island, there seems to be an invisible line. Most predations occur near or inside this line of death. As the seals approach the line, some take evasive action. They stop porpoising and dive out of view. They apparently cross the final distance to the island near the relative safety of the bottom. But other seals don't take this evasive action. They keep heading for the island at the surface, right through the death zone. 
there definitely were situations where you look out there at that seal and you think that seal is screwing up. It's doing the wrong thing. And you keep your eye on the animal and watch it get killed. If the first assault fails, the shark stays in the hunt. The seal flees, careful to leap away from the head of the shark and toward the tail, keeping his eyes on the predator all the time. The shark uh, it has to break off visible contact because the seal can avoid him as long as the seal can see him. So the shark veers into murky water, perhaps for cover. And then there'll be a hiatus, and then the shark will find the seal again and makes a, a, another lunge and has a reasonably good chance of surprising the little animal the second time around. When the shark hits, not even the idea of the seal remains. I think the historical perspective, and even Peter Benchley's Jaws perspective, was one of an animal that reacted only out of instinct, eons of evolution driving a machine. And it's pretty clear to me that white sharks are capable of learning and more than that, that they have some sophisticated behavior patterns that aren't things that are just inherited. What, what is too complicated to be inherited is, is learned. And white sharks are clearly doing some complicated stuff. As the sun arcs lower in the sky, Dublé's opportunity to photograph a breach finally returns. It's time to tow again, but this time there's a twist. The decoy has been outfitted with a tiny video surveillance camera. It's designed to give David a one second warning before a breach. Now that their pitiful fake seal has eyes, David might have a chance. As they tow, the surveillance camera reveals a fuzzy blue and white image of the sea beneath the decoy. So far, it's just a boring blue picture loaded with gut-wrenching portent. With one crew member monitoring what the camera sees, David is poised to shoot when he hears the signal. Just as the motors begin to lull them into a trance, it happens. Out of the water. Head? Head out of the water. Right. Face out of the water. Uh, Minko. So you've been happier now, Dave? Yes. <laughs> you know, that was a shark. He was no little shark, that was a grande shark. Sharks of False Bay have given David at least one series of remarkable shots and knocked the scales from Peter and Rodney's eyes. To the team's delight, they have heard of another place farther up the coast that promises more amazing developments. 25 years ago, when Jaws was released, the idea of going down in a cage to see a great white just for fun, would have been dismissed as insane. 
And yet here, in the town of Gans Bay, seven different shark dive operators take tourists out to see the great whites every day. We saw 17 individuals today come down and be willing to pay $100 to go offshore and see a great white shark. It's as if we were discovering King Solomon's mines, you know. Suddenly, this is, I didn't know a place like this existed. A cage diving company called Marine Dynamics has been working those mines for the last two years. Their chief shark wrangler is Andre Hartman, who has an amazing touch with the sharks. It started off yeah. by just pushing them off. Yeah. And then one day, after the first year, I just a little one came in and I tried it. I just grabbed it by the nose and it came up in a big store oh. like and it was beautiful. Not surprisingly, this little maneuver had never been tried before. And no one is exactly sure what is happening here. When Andre grabs a snout, the shark raises its head out of the water and gapes as if to feed. In some instances, Andre's touch seems to put the shark into a kind of trance or state of confusion where it drifts for a few seconds before it regains composure. There is no scientific explanation for this strange torpor. That doesn't bother David. South Africa is proving to be the shark photographer's Valhalla. on an expedition slated to run for a total of 54 days. It is here, on day 49, that Dubelet is finally overwhelmed with absolute sharkness. <laughs> oh, shark, I love you. Nice. Come on, show us your other side. Nice light. Nice pass. Yeah, I think I'd like to try that. Ready, hop it? Yeah, you should try it. Look at that. And there the it comes. Look at it. <laughs> Rosie just nailed it. I can see it's thrilling to watch it because the power that you've got over that big shark is and pushing him off of the there. Really, I'd like to try it myself, but you know, I'd like to pick the shark I did right, it with. On the bait. Oh God, he's back. 37 years after his shark attack, Rodney Fox has a chance to wrestle with his demons in a way he never imagined. close to the teeth, so I think my hand came back a little bit. I would have liked to have put my hand under, further under the nose, but my something told me not to lean too far forward. I think it was self-preservation. <laughs> For Rodney, laughing with adrenaline, it may be the first time he's ever had power over the shark in a way that leaves everyone in one piece. Oh, I've seen that before when it was attacking. Right up. Oh, God, it really is. <laughs> Come on, you beautiful. Come and let me play with your chin. That's a good shot. Come on, baby. <laughs> That's as close as I've been to a chopping shark without drawing blood for a while. I thought that was pretty exciting. And I'd like to uh, open his mouth wider tomorrow. <laughs> The willingness of a 
14, 15 foot animal to have its nose grabbed by a human being and shoved away. It's astonishing to me. This animal is so sophisticated, we've learned so much. It's almost as if this isn't the same animal that I wrote about a quarter of a century ago. And if there's one thing I know for dead certain, it's that I couldn't possibly write Jaws today. I could not turn this beautiful beast into a villain. Africa. How long have I been in here? Hours, four hours. Four hours? It has been a photo marathon. In some six hours of work, David has shot nearly 2,000 pictures. When the final 16 images for the article are selected, almost half will have been shot today. All but three will have been made in South Africa. Well, it's, it's nice to have something like this, you, you know, you, you dream of this, you, you see it once and then years go by or time goes by and then it happens again. And this is a different world. Oh. Africa, man! And this is a flight. <laughs> Benchley has fared no worse. South Africa's revelations have given him a great lead and the heart of his story. Okay, let's go home. <laughs> 25 years ago, we met a monster that drove us from the sea. It was malevolent, evil, a maniac. The demonic fiend in Jaws bears little resemblance to the real shark. And yet, we cannot forget those teeth. The final pictures and words of Dubelet and Benchley's article leave us pondering the same dilemma. They tell a story of remarkable beauty and tenacious power, of an animal worth preserving, not just because it's essential, but because it is such a perfect fish. Ultimately, the images reveal a sharkness that is absolute, an animal far more fascinating than the maniac that got us started in the first place. But something of that monster remains. Not the maniac, but the predator. The creature that, no matter how well we understand it, will forever swim the dark regions of our minds. And that's, that's a shark picture.